أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد سيد المرسلين خاتم النبيين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين عباد الله أوصيكم وإياي بتقوى الله وطاعته وأحذركم وإياي عن عصيانه تعالى ومخالفة أمره يقول الله تعالى في كتابه العزيز من عمل صالحا فلنفسه ومن أساء فعليها وما ربك بظلام العبيد Let us begin my dear brothers and sisters by entering into a state of remembrance of Allah a state of worship a state in which we empty from our hearts all of the emotions that occupy it and from our minds all the thoughts that occupy it thoughts of family, thoughts of work, thoughts of all the issues that we busy ourselves and occupy ourselves with in the life of this dunya, of this world. And when we empty ourselves from all of that, the one thing that we cannot empty is the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in this moment of inner centering and stillness, we submit our hearts before the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Almighty, the Exalted, and we bear witness to Him. We bear witness that there is no God but Allah alone, the Almighty, the All-Merciful, the All-Powerful, the All-Knowing, the All-Forgiving. And we complete this testimony by bearing witness that our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is his beloved servant and messenger. These two shahadatain, these two testimonies of faith, have been called the keys to paradise. May we perform these acts of bearing witness and may they in, may they in fact open the gates of paradise for all of us, inshallah. My dear brothers and sisters, because of the enforced social distancing required by this coronavirus epidemic or pandemic rather, many Muslims have wondered, was it permissible to perform an online Jum'ah prayer? You may have seen a circulated fatwa that determined that an online Jum'ah would not meet the classical requirements of Jum'ah prayer under the rules of all the major schools of Islamic jurisprudence. The reasoning in this fatwa essentially was based on the physical necessity of being together. This is perfectly understandable because until the development of modern technology, there was no way for anyone to see the khatib or the imam or hear his sermon, his khutbah, or participate in the ambience of the experience. But is this argument persuasive in our modern age? And even if it were, should not the application of necessity and need, an established principle in Islamic jurisprudence, permit us to suspend this argument during this time of the coronavirus epidemic? The Islamic juristic principle of al darura which means necessity or need permits that which is normally forbidden has been applied by classical Muslim jurists to situations of necessity. The classical example given is that if a Muslim suffers from a bad cold or a flu and needs to consume a medication like NyQuil that contains alcohol, it is deemed halal to consume that medication to the extent of the dosage and for the duration of the illness. Clearly, this time of an international pandemic is certainly a time of necessity and need. While the above will be sufficient justification for many of you, the rest of my khutbah today will be devoted to further and more fully explaining, amplifying and unpacking our opinion as to why conducting an online Juma prayer in our modern times, especially under these physically limiting 
social distancing circumstances of the coronavirus should be deemed valid. We arrive at this decision because we do not define our humanity merely or just or primarily physically. Our spiritual masses have taught us that we are, in addition to being physical beings, we are mental or intellectual beings, we are emotional or psychic beings that feel love, anger, hate, jealousy, etc. But we are most importantly spiritual beings. Our spiritual dimension is the primary and defining dimension, both of our humanity and of our religious imperatives. Our souls is where the creative breath of God within us lies. Your soul, my soul, is the locomotive of your life and your existence. Your soul, or nefs, is the eternal part of you. Your soul is the part of you that will be resurrected and judged. In Surahs An-Nur, in Surah Yasin, and Surah Fusilat, Allah makes it clear that on Judgment Day, our hearing, our sight, our tongues, our hands, our legs, and even our skins will bear witness against us, against our souls. The Jummah is much more than a physical activity. It is primarily and fundamentally a spiritual activity. And to the extent that we can convey the spiritual dynamic online, this, in our judgment, validates the principle and justifies the idea of an online Jummah. The difference between a Jummah prayer and the normal congregational fourth prayer is the reduction of the salah from four rakats to two and the addition of a sermon, the khutbah, with a clear and definite emphasis on the khutbah. Allah alludes to this in the commandment for performing the Jummah in Surah Jummah, wherein He says, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu, idha nuja ila salati min yawm al Jummah. O you who have believed, when the call is made for the salah on the day of Friday or the day of congregation, because jama'ah also means to congregate, hasten to the remembrance of Allah or strive to the remembrance of Allah. Fas'aw ila dhikrillah, not fas'aw ila salah. The language does not say hasten to the prayer or strive to the prayer, but it says hasten to the remembrance of God, suggesting thereby that it is the khutbah that provides the remembrance of God and is the differentiating focus of the Jummah. While it is true that salah is also a form of remembering God, Allah Himself differentiates between salah and dhikrullah in Surah Al Ankabut, where He says, which means in English, indeed, salah erases indecency and unacceptable behavior, but surely the remembrance of Allah, dhikrullah, is akbar, is greater. Clearly then, the khutbah, which differentiates the Jummah from a regular dhuhr prayer, is intended to provide that vortex of divine remembrance that draws the congregation into remembering God. In the verse that commands, in this verse that commands the believers to the Jummah prayer, the dhikrullah here, or the remembrance of God, is what's called in Islamic jurisprudence the operative cause, the Arab word is illa, of this Quranic commandment. The illa, or the operative cause, is the purpose. This is something, a principle in all principles of law, not only Islamic law, Western law, Mesopotamian law, any kind of law. The law has a purpose. And the legislator legislated it for a purpose. So Allah has legislator has legislated a law for a particular purpose. Sometimes Allah mentions the purpose, the illa. Sometimes it is left unmentioned. For example, 
uh, in the in the uh, prohibition against eating pork. There's no reason given. But Allah, for example, commands us to fast. And this is an example to demonstrate the idea of the illah. كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَابْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ Fasting is prescribed upon you as it was prescribed upon those before you so that you might become pious. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So here, the, the gaining of taqwa is the objective of the fast. So if we fast, for example, and do not gain in any taqwa, our fasting, spiritually speaking, is useless. This explains the Prophet's hadith in which he said, many a fasting person gains nothing from their fast but hunger and thirst. And many a person who does qiyam layl, the qiyam, the night prayer, gains nothing from their prayer but fatigue. These hadith point to the importance of the illah, and, and, and emphasize the objective and the purpose for which we perform a particular rite. So analogously, while the Jum'ah prayer certainly has a physical dimension and effort to it, dhikrullah, the remembrance of God, is its operative cause. It is its illah in the Quran, in the Islamic jurisprudential phrasing, it is the purpose of the Jum'ah. Without remembrance of Allah, the Jum'ah, is spiritually invalid. As the very first khatib or the very first Jum'ah prayer, our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whom the Prophet describes as a mudhakkir, meaning a person who reminds of Allah, powerfully drew his companions into a spiritual, into a spiritual vortex of divine remembrance. The evidence of this is in a hadith about a young man named Hanwala, who died in the battle of Badr, the very first battle the Prophet had to fight. One day he was walking past by Abu Bakr who greeted him and asked how he was. Hanwala responded by expressing his fear that he might have become a hypocrite, which was something that the Prophet's companions dreaded, especially as the Quran repeatedly underlines the importance of sincerity of faith, ikhlas, making their faith sincere, practicing their faith sincerely for Allah. When Abu Bakr shocked to hear this, asked why he felt that way, Handala answered, because when I'm in the presence of Rasulullah, when I'm in the presence of the Messenger of God, and he talks to us about Allah, about heaven, about hell, I feel like, I can, like I'm seeing that in front of my eyes. But when I return to my family and occupy myself with my work, I lose that feeling that I have in the Prophet's presence. Abu Bakr admitted that he too felt the same, or experienced the same difference. So they both decided to approach the Prophet to ask him. When Handallah repeated his plaint, the Prophet smiled and answered, Ya if you can maintain that state that you experience in my presence, indeed the angels would greet you in your homes and in the streets, or you might say privately and in public. But the Prophet added, there are times and there are times. And he repeated this a total of three times. A Prophet by definition, is the locus of a powerful spiritual vortex. When he speaks of God and channels God's presence and power and God's arguments and God's words, he draws his audience spiritually, intellectually, emotionally into that divine vortex of remembrance. The Prophet is our exemplar, our Uswatun Hasana, in how we perform our religious and spiritual rites. Imagine what it would be, have been like to listen to the Prophet himself deliver a sermon and to feel what Hanwala and the Prophet's companions felt. This function of drawing people's hearts and minds to the remembrance of Allah is what jurists, in my opinion, 
uh, have referred to somewhat inadequately as wa'al, which is a necessary component of the Juma khutbah. But wa'al more accurately refers to warning the congregation about God and his justice. And its primary modus operandi is that it serves by invoking the fear of God and fear of his justice to prod us into piety. Dhikrullah functions in the opposite direction. It appeals to our desire to love God, our desire to di for his intimacy and, his to and the feeling of togetherness with Allah, which Muslim scholars have called ma'ayyatullah, meaning companionship of God, or literally togetherness with God. The purpose of remembering God, the purpose of the Jummah prayer, that is divine remembrance, is about precisely that, brothers and sisters. It's about generating in ourselves a deeper companionship with God, a deeper sense of ma'ayyatullah, of togetherness with God, to remember God so that he remembers us, or in the words that he has commanded us, fadkuruni adkurkum, remember me, Allah says, so that I in turn will remember you. This is what Hanwala and the companions felt in the Prophet's presence. And this is the purpose of the Juma prayer. It's a'illah. Brothers and sisters, we all have to admit that we have all experienced the difference between performing a salah that we felt was good, that hit the mark, that hit the spot, so to speak, and spirit was spiritually enriching, and the difference between that and performing a purely mechanical salah that was mechanically correct, perfectly correct according to the Sharia as far as the mechanics are concerned, but that was not spiritually connected at all. And we all have to admit that we have experienced a khutbah where we felt drawn to Allah, our hearts softened and inspired to do our utmost to merit Allah's forgiveness, His compassion and mercy. And unfortunately, we have also all experienced a khutbah where we, were, where we have been yelled at, where we have been shouted at, where our intelligence has been insulted, and where we were made to feel that we were nothing but sinners destined to hell. In the beautiful Quranic verse 23 of Surah Al-Zumar, Allah tells us the following. Allah has sent down the finest speech. A book with folded and resembling meanings. Which gives goosebumps or raises goosebumps on the skins of those who fear Allah. ثم, then, تُلِينُ جُلُودُهُمْ نَقْلُوهُمْ إِلَى ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ After which, after which you have these goosebumps on your skins, their, 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 their skins and their hearts soften to the remembrance of Allah. Allah adds, ذَلِكَ هُدَ اللَّهِ This is how Allah guides us, He says. يَهْدِ بِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءَ Such is the way Allah guides. Such is Allah's guidance by which He guides those whom He wills. This, brothers and sisters, is how Allah guides us. This is how Allah, through His Prophet, attracted and guided His followers. They felt this spiritual vortex of Dhikrullah and were guided by it. As I said earlier, our spiritual teachers have taught us that we human beings are a blend of four dimensions, the physical, the mental, the emotional, and the spiritual. We are to maximally deploy all of these four aspects in our worship. This is why when Jesus Christ was asked what the greatest commandment was, he quoted Moses, or what the Torah says, where he said that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, 
and all of your strength. This means to engage ourselves with Allah physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. I quote Moses and Jesus, not only because Allah commands us to believe in what he has sent down to what came down before Muhammad, in addition to what came down upon Muhammad of the Quran, but this commandment is clearly and evidently true. All religion, brothers and sisters, is fundamentally and primarily spiritual. It is about saving our souls, as we said earlier. It's by nourishing the soul, by connecting the soul to God and strengthening our soul's connection. As Jesus rhetorically asked, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Allah swears in Surah Al-Shams, وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقَوَاهَا Allah swears by the soul and by him who formed it or who perfected it, who inspired it. فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقَوَاهَا which means and by him who inspired it with its licentiousness and its piety, or by its evil and by its good. Successful is the one who purifies it, and the loser is the one who buries it. Dasa means to bury it, to dishonor it. Allah also asks in the Quran rhetorically, and who is the one who turns away from the path or the exemplary path of Abraham except the one who dishonors his own soul? Safih means to be stupid, foolish, to discredit, dishonor, to depreciate. Every act of good worship, brothers and sisters, is intended to appreciate, to purify, to raise up, to honor our souls, to heighten its value in the eyes of God. And every act that depreciates our soul, that sullies it, that dishonors it, that debases it, that makes it feel heavy, even if performed physically as an act of worship, is wrong, is spiritually wrong. Our acts of worship certainly have a physical dimension and do provide physical benefit, but their primary goal and purpose is not physical. The same applies to the engagement of our mental and emotional dimensions of being. Worship is physically beneficial, mentally beneficial, and emotionally beneficial, but most important is the engagement of our soul, our spiritual being, for that is what ultimately validates and determines the value of our acts of worship. Absent that, our acts of worship are relatively hollow and empty. This is why Allah critiques in Surah Al-Ma'un those who pray and are unmindful of their prayers, who show off, who prevent aid, who pray for the wrong reasons. فَوَيْلُ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ Allah says, أَلَذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَوَاتِهِمْ سَاهُونَ أَلَذِينَ هُمْ يُرَاءُونَ Physical presence and perfection of physical performance without spiritual presence, without spiritual correctness, without purity of intention, not only invalidates our prayers in Allah's eyes and judgment, it invokes Allah's anger. Our modern technology, alhamdulillah, allows us to be spiritually together intellectually together, and emotionally together, even though we may not be physically together. The precise opposite of what elicits God's anger is what Ma'un. Why should it elicit Allah's disapproval as a valid Jummah? Moreover, the Prophet instructed us that when he has commanded us to do something, that we should perform it to the best that we can. Based on this teaching, an elderly infirm person who cannot perform sujood or sajda and then stand is allowed to perform their prayers while seated. 
the imperfections and limitations of our physical capacity to perform the salah has no negative impact on its spiritual value. So if the best of our capacity during this coronavirus pandemic is to perform Juma online, should not the same argument apply? Another value of the Juma is it's creating and sustaining a feeling of community. While the whole Ummah of Muhammad comprises one global community, we're at the same time members of sub-communities within the global Ummah. Every such sub-community, or to borrow a term from our Christian brethren, every parish comprises a community that is bonded by a particular mosque and anchored and in and by its Jum'ah prayer. Islamic law indirectly recognizes and validates our sub-communities by the fact that the Jum'ah prayer is not an obligation upon a traveler, but upon those who are resident. The pandemic has heightened our sense of vulnerability. It has engendered in all faith communities a much greater sense of spiritual urgency. It has amplified our collective need to connect with Allah. Our sub-communities feel a deeper spiritual hunger and desire to nourish their souls. They long to feel and sustain their sense of being part of a community under God and under his protection. A sense now frayed by the requirements of social distancing. We desire more fervently to respond to the Quranic commandment to hold fast to the rope of Allah. To hold fast to the rope of Allah together, together, and not to separate. We feel the desire to clasp more, more, more fervently and more urgently to the rope of faith that He has sent down upon us. And to aggregate and to congregate our prayers and to join them together. Finally, Allah says in the Hadith Qudsi that if we make one step towards Allah, He will respond with two steps towards us. If we approach Him walking, He would come to us jogging or running. Extending this Hadith, my dear brothers and sisters, if we approach Allah online, because we cannot do it physically. I'm willing to bet on the last mercy that Allah will accept our intention and will respond to it. For all actions are judged by their intention, as the Prophet said in the very first hadith quoted in Sahih al Bukhari's collection. So let us approach Allah, my dear brothers and sisters, as best as we can under these trying circumstances. Let us join our voices and our hearts and minds in supplicating and, and praying to Allah that he let us pass through this pandemic safely and to minimize the number of people who are uh, martyred by this pandemic. Let us approach Allah as best as we can, and may we trust in Allah to reciprocate our attempts at remembering Him. For as He has said, instead of withdrawing Allah's rope from our fellow Muslims, let us cast Allah's rope to, uh, to all who seek to clasp it. May Allah protect us and bless us all. My dear brothers and sisters, supplicate to Allah that He may answer us. Of Allah Ta'ala, I said, you believe in Alaikum. Alhamdulillah. الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا كما أمر ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له المتعالي على المشاركة والمشاكلة لسائر البشر 
ونشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم عبده ورسوله النبي المعتبر وعلموا أن الله تعالى صلى على نبيه قديما فقال تعالى ولم يزل قائلا عليما وآمرا حكيما تنبيها لكم وتعليما وتشريفا لقر النبي وتعظيما إن الله ملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما صليت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حمد مجيد ورضى اللهم عن الأربعة الحنفاء السالة الحنفاء المميزين بعده بالرعاية والولاة والاصطفاء ذوي القدر العلي والفخر الجلي ساداتنا وموالينا وأئمتنا أبو بكر الصديق وعمر وعثمان وعلي ورد عن السبتان السعيدين السلين الشهيدين القمرين النورين سيد شباب أهل الجنة في الجنة ورحان نبي هذه الأمة الإمام أبي محمد الحسن والإمام أبي عبد الله الحسين وعن أمهنا فاطمة الزهراء وعن جدتهما خديجة الكبرى وعن عائشة أم المؤمنين وعن بقية أزواج رسول الله أجمعين وعن التابعين فتابع التابعين وتابعهم بأحسن إلى يوم الدين اللهم اغفر المسلمين والمسلمات المؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات إنك سميع قريب مجيب الدعوات يا رب العالمين اللهم وأيد الإسلام وأعلي وانصر كلمة الحق والإيمان اللهم اجعل خر زماننا آخرة فخر أعمالنا خواتيمها فخر أيامنا يوم لقائك وارفع مقتك وغضبك عنا اللهم ارفع مقتك وغضبك عنا اللهم ارفع مقتك وغضبك عنا لا تسلط علينا بذنوبنا من لا يخافك فينا ولا يرحمنا يا رب العالمين اللهم أصلح أحوالنا وبلغنا مما يرضيك آمالنا واختم بالصالحات أعمالنا وبالسعادة آجالنا وتوفنا وأنت راض عنا يا رب العالمين أسأل الله العظيم رب العرش الكريم أن يغفر لي ولكم والمسلمين أجمعين عباد الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعاذكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكروا الله العظيم يذكركم وأقم الصلاه